Dobar dan, dobrodošli, benvenuti. I would like to welcome all the audience. Thanks to the Instituto Italiano di Cultura, Institut Nove Rivie, for organizing this meeting today. But the special welcome goes to the, our today guest, Professor uh, John Jeffries Martin from the University Duke of North Carolina. Uh, and he will talk us about the cannibals, Christians and the ethnographic imagination, Montaigne and his contemporaries. Well, tell me, tell me, John, uh, uh, we, we knew each other just uh, 20 years, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell them that you are a good guy, but not just a good guy, you are an excellent researcher and an excellent professor. We are familiar in some uh, researches, but this this research is his own. He will continue on it, but he just prepared uh, another studies, another researches. Probably he will talk something about them also today, but now he will present, as we said, the cannibals. Well, John, can you tell us a bit how you are come to this project on Montaigne and cannibals. How is it related to your work in general? Okay, happy. Well, first of all, before I say that, I want to say how happy and honored I am to be here. Um, it's a terrific opportunity to meet colleagues from Slovenia. Um, it's wonderful to have Darko's friendship and to meet Tomas and others here. Um, Slovenia strikes me as a crossroads of cultures. It's always been a place where many languages and many cultures have met, and I hope that having an American here who's speaking uh, about a Frenchman who's writing about Brazilians um, is in the spirit of Ljubljana's interest in the way in which uh, different cultures might connect. And I appreciate Darko's question about why am I talking about cannibals. Um, it's not a topic that I would have originally anticipated working on. It really converges from two interests. One is I've always had an interest, even though my major field of study is Italian history, I've always had a deep interest in Montaigne. He's been a writer since university whom I've come back to again and again and again, and I find him a challenging writer, an interesting writer, uh, a person who thought about his world in a very profound way, and I think it's a wonderful <coughs> text, the essays of Montaigne to study. But the other reason that I'm working on cannibals a bit is that, or I should say I'm not working on cannibals, I'm working on the way in which people thought about cannibals, the way in which people in the early modern world represented cannibals, is that I'm currently working on a book entitled Crossing the Pillars of Hercules, Europe's First Modernity. It's a book about early modern history, Storia Moderna in Italian. Um, and I pay a great deal of attention in this book to the representations of the non-European world, the way in which Europeans began to think about the world outside of Europe and represent that world to themselves, and cannibalism was one of those early representations. So that's roughly how I've come to this. So in his essay on cannibals, the French humanist Michel de Montaigne, after offering a brief account of cannibalistic practices of the Tupinamba in Brazil make the following observation. Montaigne writes, I am not sorry that we notice the barbarous horror of such acts, 
but I am heartily sorry that judging their faults rightly, we should be so blind to our own. I think there's more barbarity in eating a man alive than in eating him dead, and in tearing by tortures and the rack a body still full of feeling, in roasting a man bit by bit, in having him bitten and mangled by dogs and swine, than in roasting and eating him after he is dead. In this passage, as elsewhere in the essays, Montaigne invites his readers not to be too quick to judge what might appear at first to be the barbarity of another culture. This is a familiar theme in his work in which he frequently underscores how varied are the customs and beliefs of different peoples and accordingly how hard it is to judge others. Indeed, he would rather, in our learning of others, to have us hold up a mirror to ourselves. It's a very interesting image he uses. We study other cultures, and in doing so, we hold up a mirror to ourselves. This fascination with a variety of customs led Montaigne to read the ancient authors avidly. He cites them frequently, but he was also curious about his own world. He read with great interest reports from Asia and the Americas, and he thought hard about what the discoveries of his time period meant for his understanding of his own world, and in particular for his understanding of France, that at that time was roiled by civil wars, brutal killings, and tortures. We are accustomed to thinking of Montaigne, the humanist, in his tower library at his chateau. We are less likely to recall Montaigne's ties to the world of trade and discovery. And yet Montaigne and his family did have deep ties to the broader world through their long association with the city of Bordeaux, France's busiest Atlantic port, his father's family, the Akim, had grown wealthy there through the herring trade, through the wine trade, and belonged to a group, a large group of French bourgeois who were able, because of their newly acquired wealth, to make themselves gentilhommes or nobles over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries. In 1477, Montaigne's great-grandfather, Ramon Ekim, had purchased a noble title. It was Ramon's son and Montaigne's grandfather who then purchased the castle at Montaigne. Montaigne's own father had furthered the family's ennoblement by serving with distinction in the wars in Italy. In the, essay, in the essays, Montaigne reveals very little about Indeed, he seems to go out of his way to conceal this bourgeois background. Rather, Montaigne presents himself as largely detached from the noisy affairs of the world. He was not. As a boy, he had been a student in Bordeaux. He then went on to law school, probably at Toulouse, and then his early career from 1554 to 1562 was spent as a judge in the Parlement of Bordeaux. It's true that he retired in 1570 or 1571, but he did not extricate himself from politics entirely. In 1581, he was elected mayor of Bordeaux, an office he held until 1585. In Bordeaux, along its docks, Montaigne would have seen and conversed with men returning from voyages across the Atlantic he would have heard tales of a larger world. And the mark of this larger world and the perspective it brought was palpable in the essays. In the essays, or the essays themselves belonged to a Europe that was beginning to make its first reckonings of its relations to the larger world. And on this front, Montaigne was hardly alone. Many writers, merchants, explorers, conquerors, and missionaries had begun to write about the newly discovered civilizations in the New World or to provide new perspectives on Asian societies. 
long known but now known in greater and greater detail. Such literature and the way it was read and interpreted would come to play a major role in the shaping of Europe itself. When Montaigne gave his essay the title De Cannibal on cannibals, he was first and foremost making use of a modern term. The classical term, one Montaigne would have known from such ancient authors as Herodotus and Pliny, was anthropopagi, those who feed upon human flesh. By contrast, the term cannibal, coined by Columbus, was new. Montaigne's title, therefore, signaled that he was not writing about the ancient world, but about his own. It is rare that historians can see a new word come into being as clearly as we can in the case of the term cannibal. But the survival of Columbus's journal of his first voyage, granted a journal redacted and copied by Las Casas, enables us to watch the word cannibal take shape in the midst of Columbus's fears, thoughts, and vacillations as he tried to make sense of the world of the Caribbean on his first encounter. Columbus first recorded allusions to man-eating natives within a month of his arrival. On November 14th, 14, I'm sorry, November 4th, 1492, he made the following entry in his diary. I also understood that a long distance from here, there are men with one eye and others with dogs, snouts, who eat men. On taking a man, they behead him and drink his blood and cut off his genitals. Less than three weeks later, on November 23rd, he gave these alleged man-eaters the name cannibals. He did so when recounting a description of peoples in the Southern Car Caribbean. As Columbus reports, the Arawaks, the Arawaks are the peoples Columbus actually encounters in the Caribbean, and they live in the northern part of the Caribbean. He doesn't go at this point to the Southern Caribbean, he just hears about it. The Arawaks had told him that one of the islands in the south is inhabited by the Caribs, and they say it is very large and has people there with one eye in the forehead, as well as others they call cannibals, of whom they show great fear. <coughs> when they saw I was taking that course, they were too afraid to talk. They say that the cannibals eat people and are well armed. How precisely Columbus moved from Caribs to cannibals rather than to caribals is not clear. Perhaps because he believed that he was close to China. He assumed that the Caribs were followers of the great Khan of China and heard cannibs rather than Caribs. A hypothesis his entry of December 17th seems to support. The Caniba, Columbus writes, so thinking maybe of the Khan of China and conflating this with hearing Carib from the Arawaks, are none other than the people of the great Khan who must be very near here. They have ships that come to these lands to capture these people and take them away. Since the people never return, it is believed that they have been eaten. The Indians showed us two men who had lost some chunks of flesh from their bodies and said that the cannibals had bitten out the pieces. I do not believe this. Yet within a month, Columbus seemed prepared to accept the reality of cannibalism. An entry from January reads, they must be very daring people since they go to all the islands and eat the people that they capture. Without doubt, the people, the Caribs here, are evil. And I believe that they are from the island of Carib and that they eat men. Ultimately, it is this final view of Columbus namely that the Caribs are man-eaters that will go public. In his famous letter to Luis de Sant Angel of February 1493, Columbus writes, I have found no monsters, nor had a report of any, except in an island of Carib, which is the second in coming into the Indies, and which is inhabited by people who were regarded in all the islands as very fierce and who eat human flesh. This letter would circulate immediately throughout much of Europe, appearing first in Spanish in Barcelona and then in Latin in Rome, with further Latin editions in Antwerp, Basel, and Paris. In 
but it's Columbus's letter of 1494 about his second voyage, a text which would find even wider circulation that proves responsible for the introduction of the word cannibal into Western languages. Columbus writes, but as amongst all these islands, those inhabited by the cannibals are the largest and most populous. I have thought it expedient to send to Spain men and women from the islands which they inhabit in the hope that they may one day be led to abandon their barbarous custom of eating their fellow creatures. You will tell their highnesses that for the good of the souls of the said cannibals and even of the inhabitants of this island, the thought has suggested itself to us that the greater the number are sent over to Spain, the better. It's remarkable how quickly this word cannibal takes root and begins to circulate in accounts of the New World. We find, for example, inhabitants or certain inhabitants of the New World characterized as cannibals in some of the first texts to report on the Americas. Americo Vespucci, the Florentine after whom the New World received its name, wrote of cannibals in his Mundus Noas of 1503. Describing the inhabitants of northeast Brazil, whom he'd encountered on his voyage to the New World, Vespucci writes, they eat little flesh unless it be human flesh, and your magnificence must know that they are so inhumane as to transgress regarding this most bestial custom. For they eat all their enemies that they kill or take, as well females as males, with so much barbarity that it is the most brutal thing to mention. How much more to see it, as has happened to me an infinite number of times. They were astonished at us when we told them that we did not eat our enemies. Your magnificence may believe for certain that they have many other barbarous customs. And Vespucci will come back several times in the Mundus Noas to talk about uh, the cannibals whom he had encountered in the New World. Another early, early transmission of the word cannibals comes from the Italian scholar Pietro Martire d'Anghera, who drew on the reports of a sailor in his De Orbo Novo of 1510, in which he writes of cannibals, contributing to the increasingly widespread view among Europeans that the inhabitants of the New World were cannibals, the lowest form of barbarians, savages in short, to the fashioning of a myth of primitivism and barbarity in the Americas that would play an important role in legitimating the conquest of the new world by the old. Now, it is well known that in this encounter, the European representation of the natives of the new world as cannibals was part of a process of marking the peoples, or at least many of the peoples of the new world as other, and not only as different, but also as inferior to Europeans. Throughout Western literature, from Herodotus and Pliny through Marco Polo and Mandeville, the image of other peoples as eaters of human flesh had played a prominent role as a marker of barbarity. It should not therefore be surprising that many Europeans, explorers and missionaries, upon their encounter with the peoples of the New World, would have transposed this idea to the Americas. So strong was this tendency that in the 1970s, the American anthropologist William Ahrens argued in his book, The Man-Eating Myth, that the European accounts of cannibalism in the New World do not prove that there were cannibalistic practices there at all. While Ahrens did not absolutely exclude the possibility that cannibalism did exist, he made it quite clear that the practice of cannibalism was extremely doubtful and that, in the end, cannibalism was neither a practice of the Caribs, nor of the Tupinamba, nor of the Aztecs, but rather an operational representation of the Europeans that gave the Spanish and Portuguese and later the French, the Dutch, and the English license to slaughter, enslave, conquer, and colonize the Indians of the Americas in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. As early as 1503, for example, Queen Isabella of Spain issued a decree that if such cannibals continue to resist and do not wish to admit and receive my captains and men who may be on such voyages by my orders, nor to hear them in order to be taught our sacred Catholic faith or to be in my service and obedience, they may be captured and are to be taken to 
to these my kingdoms and domains into other parts and places and be sold. So here cannibalism becomes, the idea of cannibalism becomes a license for enslaving uh, the peoples of the new world. It may not be too much of an exaggeration to say that the representation of certain inhabitants of the new world as eaters of human flesh serve much like the emerging ideologies of racism would in the 18th century as warrants from, for imperial expansion and expansion upheld by the notion of the superiority of Europeans to other cultures. Yet, merely because a representation of other peoples and their practices serve colonial <laughs> interests does not mean that aspects of that representation are not accurate. It's clear that European encounter with the New World, for example, did not only bolster European confidence or result in the forging of a colonial, colonial, colonialist imagination. The discovery also contributed in a decisive way and in significant ways in Montaigne's case to what historians of ideas have called the crisis of skepticism in early modern Europe. The very fact that Europeans had found a continent about which neither scripture nor the ancient Greeks and Roman authors had known. And let us remember that scripture and the writings of antiquity were the twin foundations for much of the intellectual work of Europeans throughout the Middle Ages and well into the Renaissance, challenged the very nature of intellectual authority in Europe. How, the theologians wondered, would it be possible to reconcile the existence of the peoples of the New World with the Book of Psalms, which proclaimed that the word, that is the word of God, had reached the ends of the earth, since it was clear that the indigenous peoples of America had never, so most believed, been exposed to the Gospels. Equally important, how was it possible to reconcile the existence of this New World with the teachings of Aristotle, who had maintained that the Torrid Zone, the part of the world that lay beneath the equator, was uninhabitable? Early on, several of the great humanists, among them Erasmus and Guicciardini in the early 16th century, acknowledged these challenge, challenges. In a lecture delivered to his students at Padua in 1538, the great Renaissance philosopher Pietro Pomponazzi shared with his students the contents of a letter that he had recently received from a Venetian friend. In all likelihood, uh, Antonio Pigafetta, who had been part of Magellan's expedition around the globe from 1519 to 1522. Pigafetta had written Pomponanzi about his voyage and had said that in fact he had encountered many inhabited islands south of the Torrid, south in the Torrid Zone. And Pomponanzi says, he writes to me that having passed through the pillars of Hercules, they have sailed in the southern hemisphere for three months and come across more than 300 islands, each separate from the next, which are not only inhabitable, which, but which were also inhabited. These arguments, Pomponanzi recognized, prove that the ancients had been ignorant. And as Montaigne himself would write in his essay of coaches, our very image of the world glides away whilst we live upon it. This is a beautiful image in Montaigne. Our very image of the world glides away whilst we live upon it. And this comes in the context of his writing about the discovery of the new continent of America. And he says, how do we know that there aren't other new continents? So as we learn more about the world, our image of it is changing. And, and that sense of uncertainty uh, infuses all of Montaigne's thinking. Of course, this emergence of skepticism as a dominant trait of early modern intellectual life was the consequence of many factors in addition to the explosion of knowledge about other parts of the world. The Protestant Reformation had also constituted a major blow to traditional forms of intellectual authority. Thus, when a Latin translation of the second century philosopher Sextus Empiricus's outlines of a Pyrrhonist philosophy appeared with this argument that nothing can be known in 1562, it struck a chord among Montaigne and his contemporaries. Montaigne, Montaigne drew on this work almost directly in his famous essay, An Apology for Raymond Sabon. But Montaigne's whole work is infused with skepticism, which for Montaigne was more an ethical than an epistemological matter. For from Montaigne's perspective, the illusion of certainty was itself responsible for fueling the violence of the wars of religion. Montaigne famously drew on his ethics of a doubt, 
on his ethics of doubt to attack such practices as the use of judicial torture and to call into question the persecution of witchcraft. Certainty, that is, was in Montaigne's idea, the source of cruelty. Doubt could be the cure of cruelty, but doubt would not only lessen the violence within France, it would also undercut the claims of the superiority of Europeans to other cultures. Indeed, doubt would also play a major role later on in the early modern period in shaping, for example, Diderot's anti-colonialist writings at the end of the 18th century. By the late 16th century, when Montaigne was writing, there was a large body of text about the New World, many of which described in various ways what they viewed as cannibalism. Montaigne himself drew in particular on two French authors in developing his account of the Tupinamba. He makes an oblique reference to them at the start of his essay. I long had a man in my house that lived 10 or 12 years in the New World, discovered in these latter days, and in that part of it where Villegagnon landed, Montaigne writes, claiming to have learned about the cultures of Brazil directly from a man who had traveled <coughs> there, even adding that he had also met several seamen and merchants who at the same time went on the same voyage. But this was undoubtedly a literary conceit. Whilst we can't exclude the possibility that Montaigne met a fellow Frenchman who had traveled to Brazil, we know that his account of the Tupinamba of Brazil was based primarily on his reading. There were two French accounts available to him. One, Les Singularités de la France Antarctique by the Catholic missionary and royal cosmographer André Teve. The other, Histoire d'un voyage fait en la terre de Brésil by the French Huguenot Jean de Léry. This happens often in Montaigne, in which he seems to provide an eyewitness testimony to something he's seen or witnessed. But we know from studying the text, Montaigne scholars, that in fact he's drawing on text. It's often the case, I think, that there's something to the eyewitness testimony. I think it's very likely that Montaigne met people who had gone to Brazil in Bordeaux or perhaps elsewhere. It's very possible in other cases he actually had a kind of eyewitness experience, but his eyewitness experiences combined usually with the reading of text. Teve had sailed with the Admiral Villegagnon from France to Brazil in 1555. He spent slightly over a year there as a chaplain to the fledgling French colony at Fort Coligny situated in Guanabara Bay. Guanabara Bay is the bay next to what is now Rio de Janeiro. Rio was not yet there. It would be constructed and founded shortly after this in the 1560s, before coming back to France in 1557, when later that same year he published his famous account of his experiences in the New World. Then in March 1557, only a few months after Teve's departure, Jean de Léry arrived in Brazil as part of the first Protestant mission to the Americas. Just 23 at the time, de Léry was as eager for adventure as for helping to establish the Reformed faith abroad. He had traveled over uh, to Brazil with great excitement. He found the conditions there at Fort Colony quite primitive. Um, King Henry of France had supported the colony with the goal of countering Portugal's uh, dominance of trade with Brazil, but with the uh, encouragement of Admiral de Coligny, a Calvinist sympathizer, he had also viewed the settlement as a possible refuge for the French Protestants, and perhaps Henri wanted to have these French Protestants leave France uh, altogether as tensions were developing between the Catholics and Protestants in France. Even though the Protestants were at first welcomed on the island, the majority of the inhabitants were Roman Catholic, and for reasons that remain completely unclear, Villegagnon, though he had at first welcomed de Léry and his fellow Huguenots, suddenly turned against the Protestants. Ostensibly, Villegagnon became enraged after one of them celebrated the Last Supper. Villegagnon denounced the Calvinists for the rejection of the doctrine of transubstantiation, but his theological argument was likely a pretext. Now, I should say here, because transubstantiation comes in here, the French scholar uh, Letrignon, who works a lot on these texts of Teve and uh, de Léry, does see the anxieties about cannibalism as related to arguments about 
transubstantiation and eating the body of Christ and, and sees a connection. I have found that difficult. I think underneath the surface at some deep level, those connections may be there. But I, textually, I have not found uh, a connection that makes me think that that's a useful avenue to pursue. But, but Villegagnon must have felt that he needed to unify around the Catholics who were the majority. And he does much to make the Calvinist settlers miserable. Several of them in October flee the island where Fort Coligny is located on the, uh, in Guanajara Bay. They go into the mainland of Brazil and live for several months among the Tupinamba. And it's on the basis of this experience of living among the Tupinamba that Léry would offer his rich account of the customs, of their customs, in his Histoire d'un voyage fait dans la terre de Brésil, though it's important to recall that this work was not published until more than 20 years later. And also, de Léry will also draw a good bit on André de Tevez's earlier account. While cannibalism plays a salient role in both Tevez and de Léry's stories, it is not their central concern. One of the most impressive aspects of the work is that both Tuve and Delary offer what we might call a social explanation of cannibalistic practices, an explanation that Montaigne himself will largely adopt in his essay. Essentially, both Tuve and Delary present cannibalism as the ritual core of the vendetta or the feud. Tuve actually specifically calls the conflict a view or a vendetta, underlying in his chapter 41, the thirst of the savage Tupinamba for vengeance. But it is the passage from Durerri that is most compelling. These barbarians, he writes, do not wage war to win countries and lands from each other. For each man has more than he needs, even less do the conquerors aim to get rich from their spoils, ransoms, and arms of the vanquished. That is not what drives them. For as they themselves confess, they are impelled by no other passion than that of avenging each for his own side, his own kinsmen and friends, who in the past have been seized and eaten, in the manner that I will describe in the next chapter. And they pursue each other so relentlessly that whoever falls into the hands of his enemy must expect to be treated without any compromise in the same manner, that is, to be slain and eaten. Furthermore, from the time that war has been declared among any of these nations, everyone claims that since an enemy who has received an injury will resent it forever, one would be remiss to let him escape when he's at one's mercy. Their hatred is so inveterate that they can never be reconciled. On this point, one can say that Machiavelli and his disciples with whom France, to her great misfortune, is now filled. This is a reference to the court of Catherine de' Medici, who were seen as Machiavellians, who were undermining the ethics of the French. Our true imitators are bar barbarian cruelties. For since these atheists teach and practice against Christian doctrine, that new service must never call old injuries to be forgotten, that is, that men perpetuating in the devil's nature must not pardon each other, they do not show their hearts to be more, do they not show their hearts to be more cruel and malign than those of tigers? The particular feud that Tuve and Dorerie described was one that had long pitted the Tupinamba and the Tupininken, two of the major tribes of the Tupi Guarani peoples, against one another. At times, the relationship between these two groups must have been relatively peaceful. But the arrival of the Portuguese and the French along the coast of Brazil in the 16th century and the rivalry of these two European powers uh, no doubt intensified the hostility between the two indigenous groups. The Portuguese allied themselves with the Tupinincan, the French with the Tupinamba. And it was the warfare between these two groups that both Tuve and Durerri witnessed during their uh, time in Brazil. It was in the context of these disputes that cannibalism took place. The goal of the conflict was not to kill as many as, of one's enemy as possible, but rather to take a significant number of them captive. And it was these captives who would become ritually sacrificed and eaten by the victors. Tuve and Dorerie each devote several pages to describing the various stages of the ritual. The prisoners are treated surprisingly well. They are given wives, they are fed well, and only once they are fattened are they then executed in a ceremony 
in which both they and their captors declare their valor. But it's, no means, it's by no means clear that Tuve and de Lary viewed this behavior as essentially worse than the behavior they had witnessed in France during the 16th century. This was a period in which, largely because of the breakdown of public order during the wars of religion, traditional feuds intensified. Moreover, at the siege of Sancerre in 1573, Delery himself had been the witness to the practice of survivor cannibalism. And even within feuds in Europe, the violence could be extreme and lead, if not to cannibalism, to the ritual dismemberment of the victim's body, and in some cases, the feeding of the parts of bodies to animals, a practice to which, indeed, Montaigne himself appears to allude in his essay. In an interesting essay on Montaigne, Carlo Ginsburg has argued that ethnography emerged when the curiosity and methods of the antiquarians was transferred from the study of people who had lived long before, such as the Greeks and Romans, to those who lived far away, such as the peoples of the New World. This is a, this is a really interesting idea. Um, I don't really agree with this, but I, I want to just say something about this idea that I think is really interesting. It's interesting because the way in which a sophisticated humanist would use <laughs> philology and historical contextual analysis to try to understand the culture of the past, Ginsburg is suggesting those methods and techniques are now being directed towards contemporary cultures. And ethnography is shaped as one takes one's classical, philological, historical studies and reads them horizontally in the present to another culture. In the case of Montaigne's efforts to make sense of cannibalism, I see very little explicitly of this method. But Montaigne, like many of his contemporaries, drew on his familiarity with the practice of few or vendetta in France. That is, like Teve and de la Rive, Montaigne portrayed cannibalism as a ritual act at the core of New World conflicts that they read in light of their own experience with feud or conflicts among powerful families in France at the time they, was, they were writing. While many traditional overviews of Europe have emphasized the ways in which monarchies and other forms of government were seeking to strengthen public law in the early modern period, Feud, as the work of such historians as Edward Muir and Claudio Povolo have shown, continued to provide the public order throughout Europe's first modernity. As a result of his service in the Parlement of Bordeaux, Montaigne would have been aware of the deep tensions between the claims of public law and the continuation of private forms of justice that persisted in the feud. Indeed, during the wars of religion, as the British scholar Stuart Carroll has argued, feuding intensified among France's nobilities. In 1565, the Parlement of Bordeaux itself undertook an inquest in the Périgord, that's very close to Bordeaux, of an outbreak of armed assaults, murders, robberies that were consequences, quote, more of feuds and private hatreds than the diversity of religion. The essays themselves are filled with references to vengeance and honor. Montaigne clearly deployed the ethos that fueled the outbreak of feuding in French society. He was in part following Innocent Gentilet's celebrated Anti-Machiavel, published in 1576, in which Gentilet attributed the growth of the feud to the malicious influence of Machiavelli. That's a concern of Gentilet's. It's cited by Delary. Um, and such matters were familiar to Montaigne. It's clear also from his famous essay of physiognomy, where he refers to feuds taking place in his neighborhood. And the American literary scholar David Quint has seen Montaigne's essays themselves as motivated in large part by a desire to replace the ethics of valor, which encouraged, encouraged feud, with an ethic of forgiveness and reconciliation that would help end the cycle of violence that so deeply scarred France during Montaigne's lifetime. But Montaigne also drew directly from Delahaye's moral arguments. I began my talk with a famous passage from Montaigne's Essays on Cannibals in which he asked the reader not to be too quick to judge the barbarism of others. Teve, it turns out, had judged the cannibal harshly. As Teve writes in chapter 41, the rabble eats human flesh in an ordinary way, just as we eat mutton, and they take even greater pleasure in so doing. 
and you can be sure that it is not easy to flee to free a man who has fallen into their hands on account of the appetite that they have to eat him. There are no beasts in the deserts of Africa or in cruel Arabia who hunger so ardently after human blood as these people who are even more savage than brutal. Delary had made quite the opposite argument. I could add similar examples of the cruelty of the savages towards their enemies, he observed, but it seems to me that what I have said is enough to horrify you. And then he invites the reader to consider the savagery of Europe. This is a somewhat long quote. Furthermore, if it comes to the brutal action of really, as one says, chewing and devouring human flesh, have we not found people in these regions over here, even among those who bear the name of Christians, both in Italy and elsewhere, who not content with having cruelly put to death their enemies, have been unable to slake their bloodthirst except by eating their livers and their hearts. And without going further, what of France? During the bloody tragedy that began in Paris on the 24th of August, 1572, among other acts horrible to recount, which were per per perpetrated at that time throughout the kingdom, the fat of human bodies, an act which is more barbarous than those of the savages, was it not publicly sold to the highest bidder? The livers, hearts, and other parts of these bodies, were they not eaten by the furious murderers of whom hell itself stands in horror? Likewise, after the wretched massacres of one Coeur de Roi, who professed the reformed faith in the city of Auxerre, did not those who committed this murder cut his heart to pieces, display it for sale to those who hated him, and finally, after grilling it over coals, letting their rage like mastiffs eat of it. So let us henceforth no longer abhor so greatly the cruelty of the cannibals, that is, of man-eating savages. For since there are some here in our midst even worse and more detestable than those who, as we have seen, attacked our enemy nations, while the ones over here have plunged into the blood of their kinsmen, neighbors, and compatriots, one need not go beyond one's own country nor as far as America, to see such monstrous and prodigious things. But Montaigne does not draw only on Tuve and Delary. He also develops a genuinely anthropological argument. Let me be explicit here. He is concerned not simply with ethnography, that is, the description of a particular culture, but also and above all with anthropology, with a general understanding of the human condition and in teasing out what diverse cultures, despite their diversity, have in common. It's in this context that he develops a distinction between nature and culture that will resonate down through Rousseau and beyond. It is a distinction based in part on such ancient writers as Virgil and Tacitus that enabled him to overturn implicit hierarchies in which the civilized world of Europeans stood in a superior position to the savage world of the Tupinamba. As Montaigne observes, the Tupinamba are savages in the same way that we say fruits are wild, which nature produces of herself and by her own ordinary progress, where in truth we ought rather to call those wild whose natures we have changed by our artifice and diverted from the common order. And he then adds, these nations then seem to me to be so far barbarous as having received but very little form and fashion from art and human invention, and consequently to be not much more remote from their original simplicity. Thus, the new world offers an example of a culture in which there is no manner of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no science of numbers, no name of magistrate or political superiority, no use of service, riches or poverty, no contracts, no succession, no dividends, no properties, no employments, but those of leisures, no respect of kindred, but common, no clothing, no agriculture, no metal, no use of corn or wine, then he adds, the very words that signify lying, treachery, dissimulation, avarice, envy, pardon, never heard of. So the new world doesn't have many of the things we would say we value, but it also doesn't have these vices that clearly plague us. This argument provides Montaigne with this essential point, his deconstruction of the notion of savagery or barbarism. I find that there is nothing barbarous and savage in this nation by anything that I can gather excepting that everyone gives the title of barbarism to everything that is not in use in his own country. And then, as if to underscore the reality of a common humanity, Montaigne even points to the existence of cannibalism in the ancient world and modern Europe. 
He provides examples of survivor cannibalism and even of medicinal uses of carcasses and mummies, noting that physicians make no bones of employing it to all sorts of use, either to apply it outwardly or to give it inwardly for the health of the patient. But there never was any opinion so irregular as to excuse treachery, disloyalty, tyranny, and cruelty, which are, which are our familiar vices. It would not, however, be Montaigne's account of cannibalism that would prevail. Another narrative, one that stressed the barbarism of the cannibals of the New World would, by a remarkable coincidence, it was another first-hand account of the Tupinamba, written almost contemporaneously with the French accounts of de la Rie and Teve. This was the best-selling account by the German adventurer Hans Staden, Die wahrhaftige Historie und Beschreibung einer Landschaft der wilden, nackten, grimmigen, menschfreischen Leuten in der neuen Welt Amerika gelegen, or the true history and description of a country of savage, naked, and man-eating peoples situated in the New World of America, published in Marburg in 1557 and almost immediately translated into Latin, Dutch, and German. Staden, a native of Hesse, who had likely served as an Arquebusier and the Schmalkaldic League had set out from Germany with the original intent of traveling to India. But after making his way to Lisbon and learning that he had missed the fleet to India, he settled in 1547 for a passage to Brazil. I, I love this idea of the kind of serendipitous way of winding up in Brazil. You leave Marburg on your way to Lisbon, you think you're going to India, and you wind up going to Brazil. He returned to Portugal the next year, and then in 1549 traveled back to Brazil. There he became a gunner in a Portuguese fort, where he must have also learned the local language, for it was largely his knowledge of a Tupi language that would save him when he was captured in 1552 at by the Tupinamba. At first, Staden, who was captured, was stripped naked and was told that he would be eaten, and he was certain that he would die. But he managed to convince his captors that he was not Portuguese but German, and that he, would be, he could be beneficial to them as a kind of shaman. But while he was not killed, he did live among them for nearly two and a half years, and this provided him with an opportunity to witness their cannibalistic rites firsthand on several occasions. These he describes in great detail in his book, which he wrote shortly after returning to Europe in 1555. It should be noted that Staden had some help in fashioning his story, and his story, Wahaftiger, maybe, it may not be Wahaftiger. There, there, could be, there could be exaggerations, but there has to be something in, in the story that's true. There's no doubt that, doubt, doubt that it sensationalizes the news of the New World cannibals among readers in Europe. Above all, its illustrations would have an important and interesting afterlife. So for Staden's illustrations serve as the basis for the illustrations of cannibals in the work that did the most to propagate the view of cannibals in early modern Europe. This was Theodore de Bries' Collectionis Peregrinatiorum in Indium Orientalum et Indium Occidentalum, published in Frankfurt in 13 volumes from 1590 to 15, 1634. In volume three of this work, de Bries publishes uh, both de Lerie and Hans Staden. But he also makes use of Hans Staden's images, or the images Staden had made, but he transforms them, as in this image, at once classicizing them and rendering them more fierce. In the end, de Brie's images, more than its text, will help fix the European notion of the cannibal as a savage barbarian and this image would indeed play a role in legitimating the conquest and colonization of the Americas, especially among the English and the Dutch. At the end of his essay on cannibals, Montaigne recalled his encounter with three Tupi in Rouen in 1562. Montaigne had traveled there to join the young king Charles IX, where several Brazilian natives were to meet the monarch. This was not the first occasion upon which native Brazilians had been brought back to France and presented to the king, but it was the first occasion in which we have a record of a conversation. We don't know what words were exchanged with the king. We only know that, according to Montaigne, the king himself talked to them a good while, and they were made to see our fashions, our pomp, and our form of a great city. But after the conversation with Charles ended, there was a general conversation between the Indians, 
and the courtiers in attendance. Someone in the par party, Montaigne does not say who, asked the Indians what of all the things they had seen they most admired. And concerning their response, Montaigne records the following. They said that in the first place, they thought it very strange that so many tall men, wearing beards, strong and well-armed, should submit to obey a child. King Charles was indeed a boy of 12 at this time and that they did not rather choose out someone amongst them to command. Secondly, they have a way of speaking in their language to call men the half of one another. Here I can't help but think that Montaigne is thinking of Plato's Symposium. Secondly, they have this way of speaking in their language to call uh -huh. men the half of one another. They had observed that there were among us men rich and crammed with all manner of commodities, while in the meantime their halves were begging at their doors, lean and half starved with hunger and poverty. And they thought it strange that these poor halves were able to suffer so great an inequality and injustice, and that they did not take the others by the throats or set fires to their houses. This is not the only passage in which Montaigne draws on an expanding ethnography to critique his fellow Europeans, a move that would be reflected later by other such early modern writers as Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Diderot. And such a move among early modern writers does much to complicate traditional narratives of Eurocentrism. To be sure, many European writers and intellectuals, as Edward Said and others have made abundantly clear, did develop deeply chauvinistic views about Europe's superiorities to the Middle East, to Asia, and indeed to Africa and America over the course of the 19th century. And certainly it is possible to discern adumbrations of such Eurocentric views in the early modern period. But it's also crucial to recognize that the relationship of European writers and intellectuals to the extra-European world of the 16th, 17th, and much of the 18th century was not rooted in either an economic or an intellectual framework which it was in which it was possible to claim superiority over other peoples. Montaigne, at least, is deeply impressed by what he learns not only about Asia but also about the Americas. Rather than viewing these other parts of the world as inferior, he saw them as different. He was impressed by what he called the magnificence of the cities of Cusco and Mexico City, but he was not merely a relativist. He was willing to make judgments about other cultures, at times viewing them as superior to his own. Certainly his report of the shock the Tupi expressed at the ravages of inequality in Europe is one example of this. But he also praised China, both for its system of government and for its technology. China, he writes, a kingdom whose government and arts without dealings and without knowledge of ours surpasses our examples in many branches of excellence and whose history teaches me how much ampler and more varied the world is than either the ancients or we ourselves understand. This is quite interesting. So here, like this idea that as we sit on the earth, our knowledge of the world changes. As we learn about China, we have a broader history going further into the past than we ever knew we had before. And the fascinating passage on technology, Montaigne reminds his readers that their pride might be misplaced. We exclaim at the miracle of the invention of our artillery, of the compass, and of our printing. So artillery, the compass, and printing, over and over again in early modern texts, beginning in the 16th century, are pointed out as examples of modernity. And we brag about this. But then Montaigne adds, other men in another corner of the world, in China, enjoyed these a 1,000 years earlier. And I've just discovered in a book by Louis Leroy, who was a contemporary of Montaigne, called De la Vicitude. He makes a very similar critique of printing. He says the Germans claimed that they invented printing, but that's just the claim. It existed in China hundreds of years ago. And then he has this fantastic explanation of how it came through Tartary into Germany and was imitated by the Germans. So this could be French chauvinism against the Germans, but it also shows a growing awareness of where modernity, how modernity could be located outside of Europe. In the end, Montaigne would have found it absurd, would have found it absurd to forge a hierarchy of cultures. 
Barbarism is ubiquitous. It is found not only in the French, but also among the Tupinamba. When the courtiers withdrew from the colloquy with the three Brazilian chiefs during the king's visit to Rouen in 1562, Montaigne was able, or so he claims, to converse briefly one-on-one -on -one with the Tupi. I talked to one of them a great while, he writes, maybe. I talked to one of them a great while, he writes, and asking him what advantage he reaped from the superiority he had amongst his own people, for he was a captain and our mariners called him king, he told me to march at the head of his men in war. Demanding of him further how many men he had to follow, he showed me a space of ground to signify as many as could march in such a compass, which might be four or 5,000 men. And putting the question to him, whether or not his authority expired with the war, he told me this remained, that when he went to visit villages of his dependents, they cut a path through the thick of their woods by which he might pass at his ease. And then, in his closing sentence, Montaigne quips, tout cela ne va pas trop mal, mais quoi, il ne porte point de haute chasse. That's no bad. That's not so bad. But what else can they do? They don't wear britches. Thank you. I have this opportunity to ask you first some questions. I have prepared three okay. questions for you, and then the audience is invited to discuss. In your paper, you argue, th this is uh, my interesting uh, framework for, for your research. You are arguing that Montaigne and his contemporaries, so Tevet and Delery, Delery, read cannibalism within the framework of the European feud. Are you sh suggesting that they did so self-consciously? Or uh, rather, was their interpretation a subconscious projection of a social dynamic, namely the feud, which uh, they were all already familiar? I, I think it's a great question. I, so I have not found in my reading so far, uh, a comparativist statement by any of the European writers writing about the conflicts in which that writer says this practice resembles mm. the feud. It doesn't mean that it's not there. For example, in addition to Teve and to Delery, there were a number of uh, Portuguese uh, writers, uh, Manuel de Nobrega is one, um, uh, Gabriel Sores de Souza is another, um, Jose de Anchieta is another, whose text I haven't really had a chance to study a great deal. They're writing in the 1540s, primarily. They also write about this dynamic. So I need to study them and see if they ever make a self-conscious effort to do this. It may, it may be that one could um, discern in the text of these writers a sense of self-consciousness, even if they don't explicitly make a comparative statement. Uh, but what I do think is happening, I think this is a really interesting question about uh, the encounters of missionaries and explorers with these other parts of the world, is that there is, in fact, already through European experience throughout the Mediterranean world, and then in the very late Middle Ages in the Atlantic Islands, in Madeira and the Canaries, mm -hmm. there's already a kind of imagination where an effort to understand these other cultures is very much part of what is taking place. But it's something I want to figure out, if, it, if, it's a, if there is a self-consciousness in this. Can we talk about the system of the resolution of the settlements of the despots? Talk about a system of... About the system of the resolution of conflicts. The system of the resolution of the conflict. Can we, can we talk about comparing the Brazilian 
reality I would need with to, European? Can we can we talk? Uh, we, we should talk about we that. <laughs> I don't know that I can, but we should talk about that. I can learn from you about that. This is uh, okay. Your paper seems to suggest that Montaigne's view of modernity was not Eurocentric. Uh, would you suggest that Europe in the first modernity was less Eurocentric than it would become on the 19th century? Yes, yeah, so this question is, is a question that I'm very interested in. Uh, I don't know what the state of play is in discussions of Eurocentrism in Ljubljana and Slovenia. <laughs> In America, we're obsessed with this question. Are you obsessed with this question? Is this a big question? Is Chakrabarty, is everybody reading Provincializing Europe and other books of this nature? This, this has become an enormous center of... What's fascinating it, to me is, and I've just read another book that I find absolutely fascinating, which is a book by an Italian who lives in the United States. He's, in fact, a colleague at Duke in the Department of Italian Studies. His name is... Roberto Dainotto, and he's written a book called Europe in Theory, and it's about um, it's about the it's really about the southern question in Italy, and the way in which writers like Montaigne and De Stael and Hegel treat the south of Italy as a periphery, mm. as a colony, as something to be Europeanized and modernized by by whom by the French and by the Germans who are at the heart of, of Europe. But what's interesting about Dinotto's book is that he looks at two writers in particular, and these writers have gotten me very excited. One is a Spanish author, a Spanish, these are 18th century, one's 18th and one is 19th. The Spanish author is Jose, no, his name is Juan Andres, who wrote a comparative work of literature in the in the 18th century, in which he locate, he actually explicitly locates the origins of European modernity in Baghdad in the 10th century. He comes from Spain, he's living, he, he's in exile from Spain, living in Italy. He starts to think about what is Europe, how does it become modern? He comes from Andalusia, he has familiarity with Arab cultures, he, he knows about the extraordinary developments in mathematics and science that take place in Baghdad and the Central Middle Ages. And rather than locating the origins of Europe as writers like Montesquieu do in the writings of the, um, uh, in, in, the in the work, cultural work done in feudalism under Charlemagne, he sees the origins of modernity explicitly in Arab culture, European modernity in Arab culture. The other writer, Michele Amari, who was an uh, Orientalist, an Italian Orientalist, um, wrote a famous book on the Sicilian Vespers, and then he published, this is in the 19th century, and then he writes another longer history of Sicily. And like Andres, he locates the origins of European modernity outside of Europe in Arab culture. What's fascinating to me about this is that as an American student of European history, I don't know what it's like in Ljubljana, I'm very interested to know, but almost every book I pick up on Europe begins with the idea that Europe is Western Latin Christendom. And we read very little about the experience of Muslims in Spain, and we tend to push Turkey and the Balkans out of the history of Europe. And yet these are integral, as is the story of Arabs in Sicily. These are integral to European, European history. When you go back to a writer like Montaigne, I think you find in him a kind of openness to this diversity of cultures. And I think Roberto Dainotto has done a great service in bringing Andres and Amari to light. They're non-canonical. They're not well-known writers at all. But even in the canonical writers one begins to find, if one looks carefully, even in writers like Montesquieu and Voltaire, one begins to find a fascination with the non-European world. Voltaire reacts dramatically against Bossuet's universal history, 
because it's purely a Christian providential history, and Voltaire begins in China. So, so there is, I, I, think, I think Eurocentrism exists in the early modern period and the first modernity before the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, but I think it really takes off in the 19th century with writers like Guizot, and that in the earlier period, you have a much more porous, a much more, a much messier view of where modernity might be located than, than what has developed afterwards. But I have no idea if this is even a discussion in Ljubljana, <clears throat> much less in Kofoskuri. Perhaps, we'll see. <laughs> Just one more question. Why does the more colonialist or more imperialist image of the cannibal, the Bryce mm -hmm. view, for example, that we see the, mm -hmm. his images, prevail? I, well, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think it does. I'm not 100% sure of that. I think, mm -hmm. it, I think it does. I, I think it has a lot to do with Debris' uh, ability to capture a Dutch and English, English public uh, just as they're organizing their overseas uh, ventures in the 17th century. And that it dovetails with that and eventually morphs into a kind of racist view of, of the new world. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm reading a lot in the 18th century text now, and I'm now not completely sure that's the case because uh, Voltaire, for example, has sort of Montaigne-esque-like things to say about cannibals as well. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>